The delivery and production number was definitely in line with where the company was guiding. If and, and if you look back to 2020, they set this sort of goal of 50% year over year growth, they said for the foreseeable future. And it seems like they've been ahead of schedule up to this point. I think moving forward to keep that 50% growth rate going, it's mm-hmm. going to be heavily dependent on the release of this next generation compact card. We have some theories out there about what the car is going to be, but that's going to be the car that's going to take Tesla from say a 2 million per year, 3 million per year automaker to a 10 million per year automaker. So this Toyota size, GM size type of vehicle maker. With the Cybertruck, I think what's exciting about that product launch is that it's going to be a vehicle that's going to have the same impact that the Model S first had back in 2012, 2013 when it first launched. It's made people rethink what a vehicle can do, what an electric vehicle was. A lot of people, I think, thought that it was, you know, electric vehicles was synonymous with golf cart. I get in there, I can go 30 miles an hour, it's going to zip me around, but I shouldn't take it seriously. And the Model S was, I think, pretty instrumental in in changing that mindset. And I think that's where the Cybertruck has an opportunity to do the same. It has a lot of new technology, like a 48 volt architecture, which enables what's called steer by wire, which is basically a way for the steering to work independent with the wheels. But it's very similar to how airplanes function today with their steering. It's a new technology. And what that allows the Cybertruck to have is, is to have handling that's very unique to that type of vehicle, a pickup truck. If you think pickup truck, you think lumbering, big, I got a turn the wheel 13 times to go left and right, where the Cybertruck is just 180 degrees lock to lock. So uh, that's going to be interesting to watch and see how that develops. I think it's going to be a very successful vehicle. The initial reviews seem to be very positive. I think the future looks very bright, especially within the sort of landscape that, that we're in now as EV adoption continues to grow. BYD out of China in the fourth quarter actually sold more EVs than Tesla did uh, globally in the quarter. And BYD will likely sell more than Tesla next year as well. I think this shows that there is a market, there is a lot of demand for electric vehicles. And moving forward, it's going to be about affordability and having a product lineup that's truly differentiated from a gas car through better reliability, better performance, better safety, but most importantly, it needs to be uh, cheaper. And that's where companies like Tesla uh, are really heading towards. Part of the reason the truck, I think, got so much fanfare is it just looks very different from the traditional vision of a truck versus the cars, at least over time, have morphed into something that looks aesthetically pretty close to what other cars out there look like. So talk yes. to us a little bit about how you think how you think aesthetics might affect adoption of the Cybertruck. Yeah, I think the Cybertruck looks for sure are polarizing. It's a freaking triangle on wheels. That's like the craziest looking thing out there, right? I think what the, the data points that we have that I think point to the looks, I think will be less and less of, say, a something that will prevent the Cybertruck from being successful is if you just look at the at the reservations the, the car has had, the truck has had, over 2 million reservations for a, a truck that was initially, when they unveiled it in 2019, started at 40,000. Right now, the lowest trim model is 60,000. But if you look at all the different social media posts, if you look at how sort of the hype the, the vehicle is getting, the amount of attention, reviews from MKBHD, Haggerty, CarWow, Top Gear, there's so much attention on this thing. And attention in the end, uh, a, a percentage of that will turn into sales. That's just the rule. That's what happens. So I think over time, the specs, the di- driving dynamics, the capability, the ease of use, the livability of the truck, I think are going to carry it forward. And that's a Tesla hallmark. And of course, I speak as somebody who's familiar, very familiar with the company. And I challenge everybody to go out there and try to see if you can find something that's opposite of what I'm saying and, and really take all those points together. Right. So this is just one part of the story. But I think that the Tesla story, why it has been so successful, is because in the end, the product speaks for itself. And if you look at how Tesla has sold their vehicles up to 2023, they've done so with little to no advertising, right? So they've reached almost 2 million units per year with little to no advertising. There, It's impossible to do that unless you have a product that speaks for itself, which also uh, creates a lot of word of mouth type of advertising. And I think the Cybertruck's going to fall directly in line with that line of thinking. Let's talk about robotics. And Tesla releasing a teaser for its next generation AI powered humanoid robot, which is called Optimus Gen 2. In the video, the company revealed new upgrades to the hands of the robot. And that gives the robot the ability to do day to day tasks. It's come a long way, the robot, since its Bumblebee version in 2022, which, by the way, was not a very long time ago. Could you talk a little bit about what kind of AI? is running the Optimus bot and talk to us about 
how much of the AI that's being applied to the Tesla EVs is coming from or being applied to Optimus. This this is the part that I think is the most exciting. If, if somebody that follows Tesla closely, this is where it gets wild. So the same exact hardware and software stack that's being used to run the self-driving software for the cars is being used uh, in the humanoid robot. The way this works is Tesla has cameras on the cars and there's eight of them that look around them and they just uh, bring in a bunch of video feed of, of people driving and uh, people driving correctly, people driving incorrectly, right? But it's just feeding a system. And Tesla has built an artificial intelligence uh, brain that basically takes every single uh, video feed that comes from the cars and then without Tesla telling it anything, they don't say, this is a stop sign. This is a road. This is a line. This is a yellow line. Don't go over it. This is a pedestrian. God, don't freaking hit it, right? They don't write any of that code. All they do is just feed the system what driving, correct driving looks like. And then the car just does it. It just learns. It's kind of like a child. When you're teaching a child something, you're practicing with the child and the child eventually picks it up and then they keep doing the motion over and over again. They get better. This is literally how the car is driving, is learning now. And so that same exact system, that foundation they're using for the bot. So now the bot, instead of having cameras in a car, you essentially have cameras in a bot or you have some sort of system that can observe humans doing a task and then the bot just learns it and it would be able to pick up a freaking a cup and pour coffee in it it'd be able to this is the one i'm most excited for for laundry okay <laughs> wash dishes okay and it's just through observations what would typically happen so before the age of artificial intelligence the way something like this would be done is somebody has to sit in front of a keyboard a coder of sorts really really advanced folks have to sit down and build systems where they have to tell the machine what to do and try to come up with every permutation possible so that the the robot doesn't make mistakes right and if you look at boston dynamics as an example so boston dynamics is a world class engineering firm a world class robotics company they're they're stuff is incredible, right? But the fundamental difference there is that somebody has sat down and they've told the robot what to do in that exact situation to try and account for its surroundings. Whereas the Tesla robot just knows how to do it because it has an actual brain. It's, it's kind of like thinking. It's analyzing, right? And, and that's where this is very exciting for people that sort of are, are following the story closely is because now we might have a legitimate use case for a robot that will free up our time at home. It will mm -hmm. enable us to be much more efficient with our work. That opens in a, in a Pandora's box of, okay, if we have robots that do everything for us, what are we supposed to do, right? This is sort of where we're going in, in a similar fashion as you have the full self-driving technology, quote unquote, removing drivers from the road. That's going to impact things like heavy trucking over the long term taxis, obviously, you're going to have a uh, quote unquote crisis of work in, in, in a way when it comes to driving. But then you throw this human or robot into play, you might have a crisis of work, period. And then we're not even talking about on the software side, on the digital side, you have your LLMs and things like ChatGPT and whatever else they're coming up with that are disrupting that area as well. So you've already you're seeing this disruption in the di digital world with things like ChatGPT, and then Tesla is going to disrupt the physical world with the Optimus robot, most likely. We're seeing how far it's come. We're seeing the videos, but it's not out there for sale yet. Why not? When is the decision to go and commercialize this by selling Optimus to the general public? What's your bet on timing? So what I think is going to happen is Tesla will start using this internally first. Okay. If I were to guess, for example, at factories, one of the main functions at a factory that I don't think a lot of people realize is just moving stuff from one point to the other. It's moving stuff from the dock door to the assembly line. It's moving stuff from one bay to another. And this is traditionally done by human labor. It's done with forklifts, right? It's assisted. But there's a lot of just picking up stuff and putting stuff down. When I worked at Tesla, I was on the supply chain side. We were in distribution. How much of it is just move part from point A to point B? A human or robot would be insanely useful there, right? Picking, packing, putting away, receiving, stuff like that. Even those basic functions for a company like Tesla, they would get a ton of value from having a human or robot doing that. And then over time, they'll use it to ensure that the systems are functioning, that it's safe, that it's learning appropriately. And then as far as it being commercially available, this is where it gets weird, right? If you think about it from a business perspective, a human or robot 
it, its ability to make a company more efficient and to reduce costs is giant, especially when the material costs for this thing are probably going to be no less than twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000, truly. And the manufacturing process will add something on top of it. You do the math there over five years, what's cheaper, a, a $40,000, $50,000 human or robot or paying somebody 50000 bucks per year and then health insurance and it's easy math, right? So will that happen first? Will I be able to go on their website and buy one and teach it how to fold my laundry or whatever. And, and not to mention that if I teach it to do something, then it's going to be able to do e that same exact thing for everybody because you just upload that thing to the brain. I don't freaking know. Okay. I'm, I'm actually going to answer your question. I think they're going to start selling these to the public probably in 2026, if I were to guess. And we're going to stop right there because that is a big, bold prediction. And <laughs> we are going to keep tracking this. Former Tesla Inside Up, Farzad Mazbahi. Thank you so much for joining.